Oops, sorry. Um, so, um, Councillor, uh, if you would unmute yourself and, oh, I'm sorry. So we'll be giving a presentation and then uh, we'll be taking comments and discussion um, and uh, questions. If we can answer them, we will. If not, um, if you could also submit um, via email, planning at cobma.us. Uh, we'll take questions uh, that way. And uh, Councillor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey Thompson, and I am the Ward 5 City Councillor. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I'm going to begin with the requisite Zoom statement that if, uh, you're, uh, if you, everyone could please mute their device uh, um, until they are speaking. Um, as uh, Rob said, this meeting is being recorded by the BCA. It will be available on YouTube. It will also uh, be available on my city councilor Facebook page. So it will be available for review uh, for anyone who is not able to attend this evening's meeting. Now this planning process is one that is engaged in by many public officials. I wanted to uh, recognize some of those officials who are on the call this evening. Uh, we have uh, Senator Mike Brady with us. We have uh, State Representative Michelle Dubois. I see that uh, Councilor at Large Wynn Farwell, Councilor at Large Rita Mendez, and Ward 4 City Councilor Suna Castro is with us this evening. So thank you all for being here. Now, it is my intent tonight to continue uh, the uh, conversation regarding the development of the Christos property in an open and transparent manner. Now, I look forward to hearing your feedback and answering your questions to the best of our ability. We may not all agree on what type of project is ultimately developed on this property, but I do hope we can agree to all work together for the best outcome for our city. I wanna discuss a brief history of the Christos property. In 2013, Mr. Christos sold his restaurant and his property to the state with an expectation that Massasoit Community College would expand their campus onto this property. With the change from the Patrick administration to the Baker administration, those plans fell through. In 2018, the Massasoit Conference Center was closed due to unprofitability. Currently, DCAM, which is the uh, state entity in charge of state-owned property, is now seeking to sell the property with the proceeds going to Massasoit to help finance Massasoit's expansion on their campus. Special legislation is currently working its way through the state legislature to elicit requests for proposals to sell this property. A little more on that shortly. Now, as the state moves forward uh, with their process, the city is proceeding forward with our own process to plan for the development of the Christos. Now, even though the state owns the property and will ultimately sell the property, the city of Brockton still retains a great amount of control over the property. We control the property through our ability to zone the area to meet the city's goals. We also retain control through the planning and development process in which we are engaging in now. It is the city's goal to have a development plan in place for the Christos lot so that any developer who bids on the property will understand what conditions are placed on the property for development. Now to speak about the special legislation that is currently moving through the state legislature, I've asked Sarah Brady to give an update to everyone regarding that legislation. Senator Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
if you're available. Thank you, Councillor Thompson, and I appreciate you hosting this meeting and everybody who was able to attend on the Zoom or live at the site, I believe. So you gave a great overview of how this came to be. Back on February 11, 2019, once the um, governor had different plans for the property, I'm talking about Governor Baker, Massasoit didn't have the, they didn't get the funds to build the Allied Health Center, which we all were in favor of at the old Chris Rose restaurant site. So they met with our delegation on February 11, 2019. There was a meeting at Mass right, with the delegation. I had another commitment, so I sent my chief of staff to the meeting, but the three representatives were at that meeting and the Mass right president discussed the possibility of the legislation to sell the former Chris Rose property and the proceeds going into a trust that Mass right could use for building projects and maintenance of their existing property on the campus. On April 8th of 2019, the first draft of the bill was sent to my office and my chief of staff submitted it to Senate Council for review as the case with all potential legislation. Over the next two months, the legislation went back and forth multiple times from Senate Council, my office, Massasoit and DCAMP to review potential language changes and questions. Then Repres Representative Dubois asked through her office to my chief of staff for a copy of the draft of the legislation, which my chief of staff sent to Rep. Dubois's office. After some time, Rep. Dubois then asked for some changes. These changes were sent to Senate Council and added to the draft of the legislation. On June 28, 2019, Rep. Dubois asked in an email to Al from my office whether the changes were made. She was sent a copy of the red line bill indicating changes which she had then asked for. Over the next two months, the legislation went back and forth multiple times from Senate Council, my office, Mass Rate DCAM, back and forth for review with potential language changes and questions. On August 30th of 2019, Mass Rate indicated in an email that they were happy with the version of the legislation that was before them. And in an email sent to the delegation asking for co sponsorships, which Rep. Cronin and Cassie both gave their support and co sponsorships of this legislation. On uh, September 6, 2019, I filed the legislation and along with the co-sponsors, Rep. Cronin and Cassie, the bill was assigned to the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight. On September 14th, we met with a representative of the Building Trades Council who suggested that the use of the prevailing wage be included in the final documentation. And I submitted this request to the committee who were then in control of the legislation. Over the next four months, Rep. Dubois drafted more changes she insisted be included in the bill. These changes were submitted to the committee by myself. The committee responded that they were, there would be ample time during and after the hearings to amend the legislation. The bill was brought on January 27th to a public hearing by the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight during the hearing, the delegation, President Clickman, Mayor Sullivan, all testified, Rep. Dubois and our other colleagues with their proposed changes that she had requested for the September 6th bill filing. After the hearing, I communicated with the Senate and House by phone and an email asking for and submitting written text of the changes that Rep. Dubois proposed to be added to the bill as reported out. On May 18th, 2020, the bill was reported out of committee unanimously and sent to Senate Ways and Means without all of Rep. Dubois's changes. When asked why Rep. Dubois's changes were not included in the version of the legislation as reported out favorably, they replied with the following. Hope all is well needs considered. This is Patrick from Chair Gregoire's office. She's a chairwoman. We are reviewing Senate 2352 and the chair asks that I send you a summary of the amendments proposed by Rep. Dubois. Amendment lines four, in 62, adding the mayor of Brockton bill out favorably. DCAM always consults with municipalities when doing any land conveyances. These bills typically name the municipality and not the chief executive. The city retains control of zoning for land use. This is therefore not necessary. Amendments section E and F, these include an advisory committee and analysis by Old Colony Planning Council as well. The amendment proposes funding and analysis with the proceeds of the sale, which is obviously not workable. <clears throat> An advisory committee is redundant because the city maintains right of first purchase 
and zoning control and can hold public hearings regarding land use and other public concerns, which you mentioned, Councilor Thompson. Amendment section N requires prevailing wage for public lease project. This is not needed because any public building project or public lease included by Master Site of the City of Brockton is subject already to the prevailing wage. Senator Brady, myself, then approached Senate Ways and Means with a proposal that repertoire changes be implemented. On June 29, 2020, the Committee on Senate Ways and Means reported the bill out favorably, recommended that it ought to pass with amendment. This amendment that was included was primarily <clears throat> grammatical. The bill was passed by the Senate to be engrossed. Then the bill was referred to the House Committee on Ways and Means. In the name of the bill is an act authorizing the division of capital asset management and maintenance to dispose of certain parts of land in the city of Brockton. And these parcels are located at 770 and 782 Crescent Street in the city of Brockton, which basically includes the old Christos restaurant site, the land that goes back to Beaumont Avenue in the Master Story Conference Center and the land therefore in the back. So it now sits in the House Ways and Means Committee. And that's where everything stands. Thank you, Senator Brady, for that update. So um, I'd like to move forward and uh, at this time uh, introduce Rob May, uh, who is the City of Brockton's Director of Planning and Economic Development. Uh, Rob and I have been working on this matter for uh, quite some time now, and uh, they, Rob, the, the city hired the architectural firm of Harriman to sketch out some development scenarios, and uh, we're going to proceed with a presentation of those scenarios right now. Uh, thank it, you, Rob, and the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, we all are living in some very interesting times right now because of COVID that makes um, having public meetings very, very difficult. And so we thought that we would try to give this process a go. Um, we have had, uh, as, as a community, um, whether they're meetings uh, sponsored by uh, Representative Dubois or other meetings that the city has held, um, we, we have had some public meetings on this process and we have taken a lot of those ideas and tried to put them into five different redevelopment scenarios. Um, it, and it's based on uses that uh, we've heard from the community and uses that have been somewhat qualified by the Urban Land Institute, which is a large um, uh, trade association representing uh, property owners, property developers, lawyers, and uh, or real estate lawyers, and, and other similar type of, of, of people who have sort of a finger on the pulse of what is um, workable, what is, what is economically viable um, in, in various communities through the metropolitan area. So we were able to take that and put that into these five development scenarios that we're going to talk about tonight. They are not um, intended to be a all or nothing kind of category. It's, an, it's a place to start a discussion. Um, you may like things in scenario one that you don't like in scenario two, or you know we take a little of column A and a little of column B, uh, but I think that uh, by kicking these around, uh, in this public process, we will get something that is right for, for Brockton. So with that, um, I would like to sh have Carmelo share his screen. Uh, Carmelo is with the firm Harriman and Associates. And they have um, been working with the city and the counselor to put together these, um, these five strategies, five scenarios. So, Camilo, thank you. You can unmute yourself and, or who's who's doing the talking and who's doing the, oh. I'll kick off first. And Emily then started, yeah. Emily <laughs> is doing the talking. All right. Thank you, Rob. Uh, my name is Emily Ennis. I'm the Director of Planning for Harriman. And as Rob pointed out, uh, we're here uh, with uh, Camilo Espatia, who is an urban designer and planner for Harriman. We're out of the Boston Urban Design and Planning Studio. Um, Senator Brady, Representative Dubois, Councilors, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. 
I'm just going to kick off and talk you through the first few slides and what our responsibility was. And then Camila is going to walk you through each of the individual scenarios. So uh, Camila, if you'll advance the slide. So our objective, as uh, Rob pointed out, was to really try and visualize five different scenarios. And again, to stress that these are not specific development projects. They're a way of testing a combination of uses and a combination of different densities of use on these particular select sites. So we're gonna, I'll start off by showing you what the sites are and talking to you a little bit about the characteristics. Next slide, please. And the next slide. So this is the area that we're looking at here, and um, uh, you'll see the uh, site itself is outlined in orange with the major streets that are connecting to the site in uh, red um, and green and orange. And I'm going to explain why those colors are in a moment, but just to get yourself familiar with the site. Here it is in plan, and you're going to see a lot of the scenarios first in plan. So just to orient you with Crescent Street on the bottom, Quincy to the right, Beaumont to the top, and Burrell Avenue, which will go through some reconfiguration depending on the scenario in the middle. So we looked at uh, a couple of different elements of the contacts, just getting a general sense of what the existing uh, development densities were in the area, what the characteristics of those developments were. So the single family, um, the commercial box in the area, the four-story nursing home, and then uh, the colors of the streets are the level of traffic relative to each other. It's important to note that these, uh, the um, characterization of the street as high, medium, or light traffic are not based on a traffic study. They are based on the amount of traffic, the width of the street, the uses of the street, and what's on them relative to each other. So I think we had an initial question on that. I wanted to clarify it. So if we go to the next slide. So I'm going to introduce quickly the scenarios and let Camilo take them through. So these are the five scenarios that we looked at. Um, and again, they're based on uh, different levels of residential density and some commercial uses. And you can see how the units and the square footage breaks out. As uh, Camila goes through it, you'll see the more specific uh, breakout. Uh, we're going to walk you through what these uses are and how they're arranged. And Camila is going to talk about the relationship of the different buildings to each other and to the neighborhood, and also the relationship of the different uses to each other and to the neighborhood. So with that, Camilo, it is all yours. Thank you, Emily. Um, so the first one, the first scenario, um, again, as we mentioned before, is just a study on, on those relationships rather than a project. It's just to test what fits in the, um, on the site under different configurations of density and building form. So this first one is a combination of two and three family homes on lots that range between 7,000 and around 12,000 square feet. Um, in this case, we try to go with the three family units loaded towards Quincy, being like slightly busier uh, than uh, Beaumont or the uh, west of the side and moved the two family units towards the west and northwest corner uh, of the side where there are smaller uh, residential developments to respect uh, that type of scale. Uh, to access those units, we have added what we are now calling New Road um, that is parallel to Borough Avenue that goes from Beaumont to uh, Crescent Street. Um, the next scenario, and so, sorry, something jumped on the screen. Uh, so you'll see uh, the taller structures uh, tend to respond to that this year dynamics of the roads adjacent to the site. Um, we added a bus stop on all the options to emphasize that potential connectivity to the site with downtown Brockton or maybe the train stations, hoping that this is something that adds uh, quality to the site. Um, the architecture is very responsive to the local context and it is basically trying to blend in. However, we are trying to incorporate principles of walkability and a uh, streetscape that has lighting buildings that provide some sort of edge on the sidewalk by being closer to the street trying to move parking to the back or the side of the buildings rather than in front of them, and adding some sort of small front yard that activates the sidewalk, but that clearly differentiates uh, private from uh, public uh, property. Um, then 
The next scenario uh, is about a little tensor multifamily, and it also tries to respond to those dynamics around the site. So for instance, buildings one and six, the ones on Crescent, are four stories while the rest are three as we get closer to the residential uses north of the site. Um, the buildings uh, on Quincy are separated to provide uh, breathing room and to encourage a relationship between the street and the interior of the development and to provide sort of pocket parks or spaces uh, for the community. Um, and in fact, uh, in this case, we took the opportunity to include a larger space that we call the heart of the development uh, with the idea of providing open spaces for the community with adequate features and proper scale as a healthy option for uh, the community, not only uh, inside the development, but maybe uh, outside the development. So you see, you see how the buildings go from four stories to three as they get closer to the residential neighborhood, being sensitive to that smaller scale. Uh, we also incorporated balconies as part of the architecture to speak to that need of an adequate open spaces regardless of the type of unit that it's provided here on the site. And again, we're trying to place the buildings in a way that encourage um, walkability to enhance that connectivity to the neighborhood beyond our site with proper lighting, sidewalk widths, uh, and landscape. Um, here's a sketch of what that open space could look like. Again, it's, it's just a sketch, but it's just to get a sense of scale and how it can be programmed in different ways uh, for community engagement, but also to provide healthy, richer spaces for, for the community, be it, again, the users of the development or maybe a wider uh, audience um, in Brockton. Um, Scenario three is also about multifamily, but with an addition of a potential 5,000 square feet of retail that can be used uh, for convenience for the community. In this case, uh, the retail is trying to respond to the commercial uses that you find south uh, and east of the site, so that there's a sort of cohesive story on this portion of the site. Um, in this case, the buildings on Quincy are closer together. Um, and it is to study the effect of that building on the street and to test how it may, um, it may improve walkability by providing a constant edge on the sidewalk rather than presenting gaps on, on that journey. Um, on this one, you also see an option for open space, the heart of the layout, as we like to call it, again, to provide the community with healthy opportunities for uh, public spaces. Um, here's how it looks with that commercial space anchoring the site. Uh, we're hoping for this building, whatever that may end up being, uh, whatever type of retail we, we end up uh, getting, to be something that activates the corner, um, hopefully with open facades that are inviting, uh, that add quality to the streetscape. Um, and um, we decided to move the entrance to this retail um, uh, vehicular entrance uh, to access from, from Borough Avenue, not from Quincy. Uh, here in the middle of the site to alleviate uh, potential traffic issues. Um, again, you see how buildings towards Quincy and Crescent here at sort of the edges of the rendering are four stories while we step down as we move north on the site. And a different configuration for the plaza, again, a sketch just on how it could look like, how it can be flexible to be used in different forums or seasons and how it hopefully can be invited for the community. Uh, you can also see here the scale of the three-story buildings being rather low and not imposing themselves um, on the side. Um, here is scenario four, uh, very similar to the previous concept, only the building on Quincy gets split into multiple smaller buildings to provide breathing room and a different relationship to the street. Um, and maybe they're becoming pocket spaces that are complementary to the lar larger heart that we have uh, in the center of the project that we've mentioned before that you see here in yellow, south of the site. Um, this scenario also has the corner retail a component of 5,000 square feet with the access again from the center of the site. In this case, Borough Avenue gets diluted into parking. Um, it doesn't really create a new road, it just becomes parking. So the transition from Crescent and Beaumont is slower and hopefully safer than an actual road, just because it's parking. 
And here's how it looks like, very similar to the previous scenario, again, with the buildings towards Quincy and Crescent being four stories while we step back down as we move north of the site, getting closer to the smaller residential development outside of our site. And again, with the access of retail from Borough Avenue to avoid any um, complications of traffic here on Quincy and Crescent. Um, and then finally, scenario five, which is a combination of single, two, and three family with a retail component in the corner as an anchor building, and maybe maybe it would be for convenience for, for the residential uses. Here, uh, the three family units are loaded towards Quincy on what we are calling lot A. Uh, the two family units um, are on lot C and D. Um, uh, sorry, the two families are in, on lot B, and then single family units are on lot C and D, also with the new road to access those units in the back. Um, again, the idea of building placement is the same. We're trying to have a pleasant pedestrian experience, and we're trying to respond to the surrounding context in terms of density and, and the dynamics on the site. And so here, uh, it's what it looks like, very similar to the first scenario where we had the two and three families only with the corner retail building on the side, um, also looking for access from Borough Avenue to avoid traffic issues as much as possible. And so here's basically a summary of the development volumes that Emily described before, just to get a glimpse of, of all of them at the same time. Um, and that's it for our presentation. We're open to any questions that, that you may have. Again, just to stress that these are not specific projects, but merely a way of looking at how different volumes could fit on the site, their relationship to each other, <coughs> and their relationship to the neighborhood itself. And with that, Rob, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, the property itself is currently zoned C2, which is a general business use. And that allows anything from, say, uh, a, a strip shopping center, to um, auto repair or used car sales. Uh, there's a, a wide variety of activities and uses that could happen in that, in that area. Anything that would revolve around um, uh, residential development uh, would require either new zoning or a uh, variance or special permit to make that happen. So one of the things that we wanted to uh, discuss here is, and, and I'm, I'm, it looks like we just whipped through these uh, five scenarios, is basically get people's responses to these um, to see what kind of uh, development pattern uh, the community is going to support. Uh, anything, um, you know, any new zoning would certainly have to go through city council. Uh, any special permit or variance would have to go through the Zoning Board of Appeals. All of those are going to require public hearings. And so um, if we're going to undertake something like that, then we need to really build some community support for whatever strategy we come up with um, through this process. So um, what uh, I ask is that, uh, Camilo, if you could go back to the existing conditions slide at the very beginning. Um, one more back, I think. There, that's the density and scale. So uh, you can see the, the single family residence behind it, the commercial um, in front, Massasoit College to the south, and uh, here is our, our blank site um, uh, through the middle. And if we could then advance one more slide, I think is our, uh, no, there it is, the, uh, the five scenarios. Um, I think we might want to start with, um, uh, if, uh, oh, this system doesn't have a chance to, to raise your hand, but if you could, um, if, if people want to uh, make comments uh, on video, uh, we are welcoming that. You can also send your comments to planning at cobma.us uh, or to uh, Councillor Thompson. 
and he will make sure that they they get to us. So um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm used to doing this in a, a webinar format where people have to raise their hands. But um, I think if we could um, orderly, orderly, Lee. Yes. Rob, if I can interrupt, Rob. they're there. They can raise hands. Oh, they can raise hands. Okay. Yeah, there's Thank a you. couple, at least one up already. I see Councillor Farwell. So if you want to unmute yourself, Councillor. I think I'm. I think I'm unmuted. Am I? Yes, you are. All right. Just this is just preliminary information. I don't need to know all the names of the people here, but to the extent that this Zoom meeting has meaning, consensus, or somebody, some group coalesces around something, how many people do we have here other than public officials? How many people on the call other than public? Official, if that, if that. As a public official, I can tell you I have three people that are not public officials with me right now and one that lives two houses down the road on Quincy Street who's very concerned about the issue. All right. And how about uh, Mr. May? Do we know uh, other than that counts? Do we have a... We have 28 that are actually on the line, including uh, Representative Dubois. Of those, we have one, two, three... For you froze for a minute. I think there's very limited neighbors on the meeting. I didn't know about it until I saw the Facebook post from Mr. Thompson. So, so, so 28, Mr. May, is that correct? Uh, Councillor Lally, uh, and then uh, Senator uh, Brady. Okay, so, the, but extracting the public officials, how many neighborhood residents do we have then? 22? Uh, I would say we have about 22 at this first go around, yes. All right, and this is just a general question to a representative from Harriman. What criteria did you use unique to Brockton to come up to these five scenarios, come up with these five scenarios? Uh, or is this general use of land in the most accommodating way in a city of this size and given parameters from the Urban Land Institute. In other words, I'm looking for something that made you focus on these five scenarios on present here in Brockton and that makes you think that these five are worthy of discussion. So I'll, I'll, I'll start and Camila, feel free to jump in uh, if I uh, um, uh, miss something. Uh, the conversations for developing the five scenarios, uh, we started off with Mr. May using the um, Urban Land Institute parameters. Uh, we've actually gone through, this is probably, I think, our third and final round of scenarios for this presentation. I think we went through two other um, uh, rounds of figuring out what types of land on uh, uh, Quincy Street and yes, Street need to <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so it's about our third go round of the different types and mixes of uses. Um, some of this is, uh, as I said, based on the Urban Land Institute. Some of it is determined by the parcel size and the relationship of the existing streets to each other as we look at how to represent these buildings in terms of renderings for architectural detail. Uh, that's when we started to look at what was happening in Brockton now in terms of those uh, mix of uh, architectural elements. Um, and Camila, feel free if you want to jump in more on the, the type of research you did for looking at the styles. Yes. Um, yeah, so on top of the actual amount of units for development, uh, we were also given um, the actual sizes for lots. So we even at some point had a scenario that had single family housing only. And I think it was determined that it wasn't economically feasible. But even if I may, uh, sorry, if I may jump back to this, these lot sizes uh, were ranges that were given to us. Um, and then within the lot sizes, we were to respond to either uh, very specifically to either two family or three family or sometimes single family, which you do see in the last uh, scenario. Um, 
in terms of where to place them. Uh, again, I think the first one was probably the, the simplest one in terms of uh, trying to place the building simply because there were the existing lots and we just were subdividing them in these given sizes. Um, but uh, where to place the buildings in terms of scale, we did look at, was, at what was adjacent to the site, how busy or how sort of dynamic those relationships were, right? So if you look at the south, which is all these commercial buildings, it's really very different than what happens to the north. So we figured um, whatever stutter, whatever might be or might seem busier or the retail, for instance, was placed on this side of the site rather than uh, on the um, maybe smaller scale. Um, and then in terms of the architecture, we try to go with what's probably typical in New England. We try to be as least invasive as possible with term, in terms of developing a building here that wasn't all glass or all metal panels. We're trying to be cognizant of something that is uh, responsive to the context so that it is not an alien, an alien development um, in Brockton. So, so just to summarize, you, you looked at what is going on in New England, adapted it here in terms of architecture. I, I'm interested in how you got to the two and three family homes on particular lot sizes. Th this is one big lot now. Who, who made the decision of who steered you in the direction of, of uh, dividing up this property into specific lot sizes, which would then accommodate two family or three family units? How did you, who decided that? So, I? so I will, and unless Rob, you want to take that? I'm well, happy I'll, let you go, I'll let you go first. Okay, let me go first. So our <clears> specific, <throat> I, th I think it should be clear about Harriman's specific scope on this. Our scope was to develop these fit studies and these renderings. This was not a full-scale land use plan. It was based on the criteria that were given to us in conversations with Mr. With, with Rob May based on the ULI study. I'm going to let him talk to you in more detail about that, but just so you know that our scope was just to develop the scenarios and the renderings that went with the mm -hmm. scenarios. So yeah, Rob, if you want to take it from there. Before we, uh, yeah. before so, we Councilor, very early on in this process, oh, uh, uh, Councilor, before uh, we go to Mr. May, I'd like to go back to the, and the mayor. Mr. May? Yes, sir. I'd like to go back to the young lady for a minute before we get to you. Okay. If we could, could other people mute themselves until it's time for them to speak, please? And this will be my last question for now to her. So if she could come back on. I'm here. Okay. What were you told by the city through the planning department? What, what criteria were you given? So the idea was to, as I said, test the different volumes. So we were to look at, Mila, I think, explained it earlier, a combination of single family, two family, three family, multifamily. In order to do that, obviously, you have to split up the site. So we went through a different um, round of analysis of how it made sense to split up the site based on those parameters, given the existing street uh, development patterns um, and the relationship of the existing lots around those streets. So we were trying to be very responsive to what's in the neighborhood now, but also responsive to the idea that we were doing scenarios at different development levels so that single family all the way up to multifamily. we had a range we didn't have a specific number of units for each type that we were trying to match but a range as camilo said we were given some lot sizes to test uh, and then worked through several scenarios of how they would work potentially together so it was an exercise a fit study exercise to see mm -hmm. what would work out thank you i i have what i need and i uh i I'm uh, finished, thank you. You're very welcome. I just wanted to add to that, that um, uh, the lot sizes that we're looking at here are, are based on what is in the adjacent neighborhood. Um, also, um, you know, we had met with, uh, or I had met with Councilor Thompson and the mayor uh, over this whole planning process uh, to help guide the development of the five different scenarios. Uh, Deb, I see your hand up. Well, uh, Rob, if I if I can before jump in quickly. Uh, is that Councillor Thompson? Yes. 
Yes. So, Rob, also I think it's important to add um, that the multifamily um, recommendation uh, came from the Urban Land Institute's uh, yeah. TAP panel that visited this, uh, this area uh, back in September of 2019. It was uh, through the recommendation and also through recommendation of uh, University of Massachusetts uh, DQ Institute study that was also done on this property that kind of um, discussed the idea of what, what would fit into this property. So uh, through the um, Urban Land Institute TAP panel, uh, they recommended this type of multi-family um, development. So it was uh, with that idea that we um, printed to have and kind of scale for us. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're at that time of the day when everybody is loading up on Netflix. So uh, video and audio jump from time to time. So we apologize for that. Deb, um, and I don't know who Deb it just says Deb's iPhone. Deb Garland. Oh, Deb Garland, how are you? Hi, how are you? You're, um, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Um, why wasn't biotech or medical usage looked at in this area since we have a hospital right around the corner that's <clears> building <throat> everywhere in that neighborhood? First question. Um, second question is, I believe that the city had a moratorium that we were only allowed to build two story homes. So why are we looking for three and four and five story homes? And there's no retail, it's, it's zoned retail. I don't get why we're building homes there. Um, I think there's a, it should be a multi-use area and when did we lose 3,000 students, Jeff? So those are my questions right now. Rob. Oh, thank you, Deb. Um, so uh, the first question, why, why not um, medical office or uh, life sciences? Yes. Um, that is a question that we brought to uh, both the Donahue Institute and the Urban Land Institute, um, at, which are the uh, deep thinkers at Donahue Center uh, or Donahue Institute. Given the location uh, next to or near uh, both Massasoit and with the uh, hospital, one of the, the areas that both of those groups studied was, was medical office and, and life science. Um, now, given uh, that, you would, you would think that there would be a stronger market for that, but um, mm -hmm. un unfortunately, we can look at some of the development that's even happened right now on Center Street. We had a, uh, a building uh, right across the street from the hospital that, and, and I apologize, I don't remember the address, but it was originally built for a, as a church. Uh, the church went bankrupt. The um, real estate company that held the mortgage uh, repositioned and, and did a lot of, of uh, changes to that building to make it available for uh, medical office space. And they went three years trying to, I think it was three years, trying to market that building for medical office space. And they could not get a taker. Uh, right now, the charter school has uh, taken some of that space, if not all. But <clears throat> uh, the point there being is that if if we couldn't move existing medical office space, the uh, Donahue and ULI felt it would be difficult to add more medical space or more office space um, to the district. The same holds true for um, commercial property, for, for retail. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how long the uh, uh, retail space has, has sat vacant on um, uh, Crescent Street. It, it's just gotten a new owner finally. I think it was mm -hmm. a, a Taco Bell at one time or something like that. Um, yes. But um, it, it took too long and the, the market the market feels that 
if we add more retail space and we're having trouble getting rid of and filling up the space that we have that uh, and at a lower price, that it's, it's going to be cost prohibitive for a developer to come in and build brand new space when we have less expensive space down the street that we can't fill up. So that doesn't mean that we can't have some retail in this in this development. And we show a couple of scenarios where there, there is retail. We could expand that. Um, it, it's up to the to the group. Um, it is zoned C2. That is a commercial use. Uh, mm -hmm. Allows retail. It um, allows office. It also allows used car dealerships and auto mechanics. So um, that's why we're sitting here uh, as, as part of this group to start this conversation. And this is going to go on for a while. Um, and hopefully it will get to a vision that the community and city council can all be behind. And uh, we work with DCAM on the disposition of this parcel. I'm sorry, I forgot what your third question was. Uh, the question, that's the most important one, by the way. Why um, I thought we had a moratorium in the city that we couldn't build higher than two family homes for sale because of we had a, a multi-family home that burnt and um, killed a um, after the deaths happened they put through I thought a moratorium that we were not to build three family homes I or at am, least just apartments. I'm, I'm, I am unaware of that, and if any of the counselors know that, would you? Maybe, maybe uh, Wynn might remember that back to the 90s. I, I, I think there is something about a three family over a certain height. Uh, yes. But forgive me, I'd have to research the ordinances. I believe it was a fire up in uh, Wood uh, that, that precipitated that. Yes, it was. Um, well, we and have triple deckers throughout the city, and I'm yeah, not familiar with. Uh, but they put a moratorium on not building more. I'm not familiar with. So that I, in the I think you need to been. check that. I, I will. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, and. Um, and and have a like to your full question. Uh, and the other question uh, the was, how did we lose the kids? Yeah. So I, um, in uh, my multiple conversations with uh, Superintendent Nick uh, Thomas, uh, he meant because the issue of uh, school density and uh, in context of some of the development that went around the state, that the, the issue of students has um, come multiple times. So in conversations with uh, Mike just regarding school density, he informed me that since 2017, the city brought in, um, lost 3,000 students um, in our school system. So, uh, Mr. Thomas told me uh, that we're actually in need of students. And so that's where I, the, um, you know, my comments of uh, the city brought in 3,000 students. Okay. And, um... and then, and also just quickly on the issue of the three days, I mean, I, I'm a member of the, um, I've been a member of the zone board uh, for two years in that city council for the past year. It's my understanding three debtors to be built um, in a few different areas uh, on the state. So I, if there are more area, I'm not aware of it. But I, I think I someone needs to that. just, you. I think someone just needs to look at that. That's all. Um, I, I would be opposed to three and four family homes going there, but um, a one or two architecturally done well would be great. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Uh, by the way, Deb, I believe your cat wants to get fed. <laughs> no, he wants to go out. <laughs> oh, go out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Uh, anybody else have comments? There's also comments that are going into the chat box. Um, and we will try to copy and paste all of that. Um, 
I know that spoken comments are recorded. Um, so if you um, have chat comments, uh, we'll try to, I will do my best to incorporate all of those. Um, so anybody else would like to raise their hand? I think I just saw somebody. Rob May? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm not good at this technology, so I apologize. Uh, but if I may, um, this is the first time I saw these scenarios that you proposed tonight. But we did have a meeting at the Baker School a while back, and there was residents that is any of that intake from the residents added to your scenarios that was at that meeting a while back. I know uh, we had more residents at that meeting. This was before COVID, of course, and there was some elected officials at that meeting. Have you uh, taken that effect as well? Uh, what uh, a lot of the comments that we got from the, the residents was that we needed to add more uh, green space. People were looking for green. Um, a lot of the comments that we got were for um, things like uh, adult recreation, um, gyms, uh, community centers. Um, so uh, some of the things that required the city to make large investments were not included in this uh, process. Um, but uh, again, if, if the city council um deems that that's that's what we want here um I'm, I'm sure we can work with the mayor and and city council to um include that into a, a recommendation i know there was a few other city councils on back then and we've had newly elected officials since but and was mentioned our job as a state delegation was just to file this so the proceeds go to massoy community college and, but it's left up to the local city officials like the city council, yourself, the mayor, to decide in, in the zoning board if zoning changes need to be done. But I think it's important because there was a lot of residents at that meeting that did give input. And I know there are residents that are concerned about traffic. And there were some designs back initially to widen uh, Quincy Street coming on for another lane, like a right turn only lane, a lane to go straight, and a left turn lane, and also to widen the entrance to Massoy Community College and I believe that some of the funding for the design was put forth but I don't know if anything has been done beyond that. That's to do with that whole intersection there at Crescent and Quincy Street as well. Uh, yes, Senator, that is correct. We, uh, the city is working on a design proposal to uh, rebuild the intersection at Crescent and Quincy. Uh, one of the issues that we have because there Quincy and Massasoit Drive are slightly offset from each other, and um, there may need to be some additional property to uh, acquired to make one or two of those uh, designs work. The mayor has asked uh, DPW to go back to um, the the uh, consultant that uh, Larry is working with, Larry Raleigh at DPW, uh, to try to. Um, rework the project to require as little new um, right-of-way acquisition as, as possible. Um, the project was, was requesting more space on the south side of uh, Crescent Street, and uh, it didn't necessarily affect the Quincy approach, but it was more about the Massasoit Drive where uh, more property needed to be acquired. So. We are taking a look at that, and, and hopefully we will get that back on track. And um, it is available for federal and state funding, which would be fantastic, uh, because we all know that that whole intersection needs to be rebuilt. Uh, I have a, uh, a person with their hand up, and I am going to butcher your name, sir, but it's... It's Yolando. Yolando Spinola. Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. You have the floor. And you're muted, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So, hi, everybody. My name is Yolando. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, for all the work that you have done um, on this. And uh, I appreciate the consultant's work, too. Um, the, scenario, I, I, uh, the scenario seemed like there's a lot of different options on the table for the city of Brockton. Uh, but speaking um, as a millennial and uh, someone of the younger generation who 
is coming up in the city, I definitely uh, am in favor of the options that are going to build uh, more housing um, for in our city. Um, I like the idea of adding more units. Um, it, we are in the middle of a housing crisis right now in Massachusetts. Um, a lot of young people are having a hard time finding a place to, to live that's affordable, um, that uh, has amenities next to it. And this is a place that would be close to uh, uh, hospitals, close to schools, close to a um, uh, lot of shopping um, opportunities. Uh, this could be a great opportunity for the city to add more housing and, and uh, young people will be able, young people and uh, older people too who need uh, new housing to move out of maybe some of the older spots that they have. We would love to see them uh, go into the into these uh, new locations. And I think it would just add more vitality to the city if we add more housing. And it's also great for revenue too. If you want to generate more revenue, this is a way to Thanks. go about doing that too. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Yolanda. Uh, Hi, Oh, Lisa is waving. Yes, Ben. Hi. Um, I actually live adjoining the street. I'm not sure. And I do, I understand what um, Mr. Spinola is saying. However, I think this is probably part of his job. Is it, do you live in Brockton? You live in Brockton? Yes, yes, I, yes I do. I grew up in the city and I live in the city now. Do you, um, do you Yes, I, I I live in Brockton, Massachusetts. Uh, I, I just googled I've, I've, mass planning, so that's why I asked. However, yeah, I have not, nothing to do with this project. Okay. However, I'm adjoining the property, Rob, and I like with a lot of other people in the city would like to see more commercial. Number one, since it's a higher tax base. And number two, our police department's overrun right now. Our fire department's overrun. We don't have critical services. I know what um, Mr. Thompson said, but I'm not sure that that's the case with the school department. But however, with that said, Brockton should not have to carry the load for Massachusetts with affordable housing. Can you tell me, Mr. May, what the percentage is now of affordable housing in Brockton? Um, right now, I believe there is 12% uh, of our housing units are registered income restricted. Right. Um, now, um, while we have been talking about different housing types here, we have not talked about either uh, market rate or affordable units. We're just talking about density at the moment. Mm -hmm. So um, just because we talk apartments doesn't necessarily mean that they're affordable uh, and that it, uh, A, capital A, affordable. Um, as opposed to affordable that I can afford to live there. Um, so, uh, Could you tell me how so many people, is, sorry, go ahead. How many people do you so, expect to be in this, this whole area? Uh, the number of people that are expected to be in this area sure. is the number that we as a group decide and city council supports. How's that for a political answer? Yeah, that's bull S. <laughs> I'm not swearing because I'm recorded. I'd like no, more. No, no, I, I get it. Um, so we put together a couple of different scenarios mm -hmm. uh, that we want people to react to. If there are, um, you know, if, if there's a, a group of people who like certain projects and we don't like some aspects of, of other scenarios, we can mix and match those kinds of things. But at the end, what's going to happen here when this gets uh, disposed of by DCAM, in order to build anything other than pure retail, which is a bit difficult, or office space, which again is difficult, or something else, and I'm sorry, my hand's going out of the frame as I'm gesturing. Uh, it's going to require support from city council and from the zoning board of appeal. And so um, whatever the group decides, you know, city council is going to have to, to shepherd this at some point in time and is going to have a large say if uh, whatever happens on this site because of the way our zoning is written. 
I do believe Brockton has more than 50% affordable units, and that's fine. I wouldn't mind seeing single family. If we're really trying to help I'm people, let's do single family homes that they can afford. I'm not opposed to that, but I don't want to really look at another like 5,000 cars going up and down my street every day. Sure, I understand that. Um, if, if I may, um, Councillor uh, Mendez had her hand up and then we're gonna follow up with uh, Representative Dubois. So Councillor Mendez, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So what I wanted to say is, um, although I'm a representative of the city, I'm also in Nevada. I live right there on Portland Street, so I hear all of everyone's concern. And uh, my neighbor on Portland Street, who could not attend to this meeting tonight, sent me an email with lots of questions. And I believe that her concerns is a lot of the concerns have already been addressed here tonight, but I'm still going to read some of the things that she wanted me to address at this meeting. And um, I believe that was already explained earlier as to Quincy Street being classified as a medium traffic street. Um, she is pretty sure, and I can also understand this, that um, Quincy Street is really a high traffic area, but I don't think any traffic study was done. That was just how it got classified in the project from my understanding, but that was one of the questions. The other one was, um, regarding the proposals two and three, that they are much too dense, the parcels together, and there's absolutely no light coming through to Quincy Street and the plans, and that the buildings are too close together. And then as to the retails and the plans, um, how will that impact the intersections uh, as to the real retail stores and the plans? And also, um, my neighbor wanted to know what is happening to the neutral oil site and how will this project coexist with that. And also, um, we, I believe we discussed already regarding school capacity, how will that affect the school capacity in the area? And also whether the traffic effect of this project would affect the ambulances that comes from Whitman Abington and the Bridgewaters. And uh, regarding green space, I believe there's not that many in green spaces in the projects, just asking some questions about that. And also regarding the fire station, if uh, with the Caffrey towers right across the street as to fire station, if they'll be able to handle it from, to be able to accommodate everything in the neighborhood there. And uh, regarding the, this was not discussed, the, um, property value of the homes in the neighborhood. And also her property is a uh, well water with, if that is going to affect the water table in the area because she does not plan to uh, connect to the city hookups. So this is just um, some of the things that, list of questions that she wanted to make sure it got asked. I wanna make sure that it goes on the record. And I understand that maybe not all of the answers may be provided tonight, but just so that we can be aware of those. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Mendez, uh, uh, Councilor Thompson did uh, forward that list of questions and that will be um, put into our report at the end. Uh, we'll be posting that information as we go along. Uh, I hope to have this video posted uh, within 72 hours. And then I hope to be working on those questions, sort of a uh, frequently asked questions, and we'll be posting that. And as we get more questions between now and the end of the month, um, as we hold this comment period open, we will continue to add to those, um, to those frequently asked questions. Uh, Michelle, Councilor Dubois is next on line. So, How are you? Uh, I'm good. How are you, Rob and team? And um, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Mendez, I think I saw Ellie, John, and everybody out there in Zoom land. So I am here with Ann Beauregard, former Ward 5 City Councillor, and a couple other residents that live around here on the site. I'm very unhappy with the whole process. I think um, 
senator timelining it, which, you know, there's some, you know, things that might be a little off, um, show that this has been a process and it has not been an open process. So I'm happy now that there are some meetings being had. I am holding this up in the House until we get more public participation and transparency written back into that bill. That is my job as a state representative. Um, everybody gets to decide what their job is. And my job is to make sure that residents are heard and that they're not um, trampled upon. And Mass General Law provides certain rules around transparency and public participation in the sale of public land. And I am gonna hold to that. So unless um, the governor and um, the DCAM and everybody else, housing wants to go through Mass General Laws as it lays out, which is very onerous, um, when most of us know within at least 60 to 70% certainty that we would we can come to an agreement and it's just in that 40 to 30% that there is some disagreement, um, the idea that, um, you know, folks like myself, a state representative elected by 40,000 people that live in 02302, which is this zip code, and beyond Jeff I'm, and Rita now too, uh, we're the only ones that live here in 02302. We wanna make sure that we're engaged and we're, we are part of this process and that what happens on this lot isn't determined by people that don't even live in Brockton anymore. You can say that your interest is Brockton, but you don't even live here. So I just want to be sure that what happens here, I am I'm really determined to get the land that runs along Cres Crescent Street and the land that runs along Quincy Street to um, at least one car length of a roadway to be given to the to the city so we can expand the road as needed, especially if we're gonna be putting a whole bunch of units of housing on the lot. There's 40 units of housing across the street that's already approved. We have, like, we're on the lot here. So down behind the gas, the car dealership, which probably should have never been, um, there's like over 100 acres of land back there. And there's a whole bunch of rumors about housing being proposed there. And then behind me, Massasoit has 100 acres on its own, and they've already talked about some potential about putting housing somewhere there and then back over here there's conservation land but there are hundreds of acres of land including um, the Lambert's Plaza which I'm hearing um, could be becoming housing so we're talking about this in this little fishbowl and there's a lot of backdoor players going on and I think we really need a comprehensive look at this and yes we do need housing but it needs to be dignified and um, we need to make sure that the people that live around here aren't left to hold everybody else's baggage so I mean I agree I've been very disappointed with this process and the um, backroom deals and the sneakiness on a lot of it and uh, having to have filed the Freedom of Information Act request with Massasoit to get the bill. Um, all of this adds up to suspicion on my part. And so I'm honored to be a state representative, but I'm also going to just demand that the people that live here get the respect that they deserve, which is um, what Well, we will keep transparent uh, participation. Oh, so here I am. I'm happy to be here. I am going to hold that bill up until we get some public what's going on and whose plan have to vote on it. So my plan now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Dubois. Um, Council President Asak has raised her hand. Council President Asak, you have the Good evening. Floor. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. May. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my question to you, Mr. May, after listening to everything is, what's the next step after this evening? Is there more community meetings or where do you, is, what do you think the plans are for um, what's the next step? Well, COVID is playing havoc with a lot of community meetings, but what we plan to do is um, this video will be posted on the city's webpage. 
uh, under the planning department. It'll also be on the uh, Brockton uh, Community Access and on Councilor Thompson's uh, webpage or Facebook page. Uh, we are going to be continuing to take comments uh, from now through the end of the month, uh, at which time, uh, oh, and during that time, as we get more and more questions, I'll be creating a frequently asked questions um, FAQ that I'll post to the web also and, um, and, and answer to that at the same time. And at the end of this uh, month, uh, I plan on then writing up a report that shows all the comments that people have made. Um, and we will then make that available to the public and to um, city council. Uh, we may then ask city council um, what their pleasure is. We may want to look at some additional scenarios um so um as i said this is kind of like our first our first run at this um i wish we could meet in person i wish we could meet on site um although it's kind of dark where michelle is at the moment um but you know at school would be nice one of these days um i from a personal perspective we have had COVID in the house and so i'm very reluctant to um meet in a large group but um we we can find a way to, to take care of that uh triple masking if necessary um but uh, uh, again we're going to be uh looking at the various scenarios we will talk to the counselors as to what their um uh, pleasure is and uh certainly uh with michelle uh representative dubois uh, who represents the area, with Mike Brady, who represents the area, and with uh, Councilor Thompson, and see what our next steps are after this. But nothing is happening tomorrow, uh, or, you know, there, there's not a, a deal waiting in the wings. Um, we have some time uh, to move this forward because, as you heard, um, the legislation has not been passed. But uh, we hope that it will be sometime this calendar year. And when DCAM is ready to put this property out for bid, we certainly hope that we will have a, uh, a vision for what Brockton wants for this site. And Brockton includes the residents that are adjacent, um, and it includes um, uh, you know, the greater community. So I hope that's an answer. Thank you. It is. It's no, that's uh, exactly. Uh, I just want to make sure that it, we get the point across that this is just the beginning. Nothing is finalized and that the conversations, um, you know, is, is starting, it's open and that you're going to be adding comments before any decisions come to the city council. So I think that's really important that, um, the residents are at the table. This is the time to make their comments. This is the time to make the suggestions, and um, you know, be part of the uh, be part of the process. So I, I understand it's a little difficult with Zoom, um, but thank God we have this technology and we're able to, uh, you know, have this be able to have these meetings. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate the information. So I will be looking forward. I heard everybody's comments, and I'll also. Um, once you post some of the comments and i um, look forward to hearing some of the answers to some of them some of the questions and um you know look forward to a future meeting regarding this site so it's this is i know a lot of these projects are in wards but they affect the whole city so it's important that we have everybody's paying attention and everybody's um listening to what the suggestions are and, because they do affect the whole city Surely. thank you I'm surely, but that yeah. said, right? What do, and Rob, you can answer this, and I apologize, last minute thought. On Thatcher Street, where is that proposal right now? Uh, uh, Rob the, could answer that. The Thatcher Street proposal is currently um, uh, under technical review, and um, all the city departments are sitting down with uh, the developer and their, their team 
uh, to hash out the departmental concerns. And it should be sometime, so this is September, October, November, it'll probably be November planning board when it comes back up for a, a public discussion. So with this proposal, you're possibly up to 2,000 of, four of uh, units on the east side, correct? Up to how many units? Well, this is what proposing 1,500 and then another 300 and something from Thatcher Street. There's approximately 175 on Thatcher Street. And no, it's more than that. I believe it's 175 on Thatcher. Um, I, I will take a look at that yeah. when I get back to the office tomorrow. Uh, Lisa, it's 175. I thought it was 232. Okay. No. Thank you, Deb. And Emily, what is uh, of the proposals, of the scenarios that we're looking here, how many, is, how many units are in the largest? But yes, the highest scenario is scenario two, and it's 192 units. Great. Okay, so 192 and 175. 192 times two people at least, or three. You have to yeah. figure it that way. It's a right. lot of people. Well, it, it, yes, but it's easier to, to count units. Uh, no, it's so not that's realistic. That's 367 I, units, not including the other proposed projects going on here. Right. So yeah, nobody, can, can nobody thinks that's a lot for like a square mile. Mm. Guys, you're all, you're all, who we everyone's mu muted. <laughs> well, it, and, and you can submit your comments. Uh, online. I'm looking for comments from my elected officials, I guess. At, I, I think a lot more discussion has to take place. <laughs> I, I agree with Council President Azak. This is a good start to a discussion of an issue that is still pending in the House of Representatives. I don't see it coming out anytime soon based on what Representative Dubois said. And I think there ought to be a lot more discussion. And I hope, I hope eventually we'll reach a point where we can have an in-person meeting with residents. I don't like making decisions based on discussions that are held by Zoom no, and I respect that, sir. But again, there's 400 units proposed within the next, by year end, they could be voted on. So I'm just asking you your, your opinion on that. In a mile area. Okay. My, if I may. My, my yeah. opinion is what I said the other night regarding another development. I'd like, to, I'd like to make Brockton better, not bigger. I'd like to do something for the people who are here now, continue the housing projects, that are currently underway. But this particular project and another one that's being proposed that might be 250 to 300 apartments in the next 10 to 15 years, you know, we can barely handle the calls now for loud parties, fireworks, we have traffic accidents because of the density of the vehicular traffic in the city. We're having a building hit once a week and I'm struggling to understand how adding more people is going to improve the quality of life for the people who are here now. Again, I'm just one of 11. Uh, I try to apply some common sense. I do listen to a lot of people around the city. And what I hear from people is, do something for us now. Help us have a better quality of life, a quiet neighborhood. So that's a lengthy opinion. And again, it may not prevail, but that's where I stand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Jack Lally. Um, Jack, uh, the floor is yours. And then I'm going to follow up with Councillor Nick Castro right after that. Thank you. No, I, um, I want to say, you know, I think I agree with, you know, what's been said, you know, just like what Councillor Farwell just said. Uh, this is a good start. We have to remember that this is not going to be a short process. This is going to be, you know, this is going to be a lengthy process. Things are going to be vetted out. This is not, um, and it should not be any kind of a rush job. Uh, I would like to see more, um, you know, I, I would have liked to see more uh, of, a, of a commercial, of a business aspect. And I know that has been mentioned, but mm -hmm. at the same time, 
uh, we also have to make sure we are hearing from and, and, and really listening to what the professionals we've asked for, you know, we've asked for professional takes on this. We got to make sure that, you know, we, we make use of them. And if the professionals have concerns about how much, uh, you know, business can actually get done there, we do have to, you know, keep an eye on that, keep that in mind. Um, I think that it was great that this meeting was held. You know, I want to thank Councillor Thompson for the invitation and for, you know, trying to trying to spread this as far and wide as he could. Um, and I look forward to this continuing. But I, I think this is what it's about. In order to have a discussion, something has to be put forward. And Harriman, Mr. May, Councillor, uh, Senator Brady, uh, as as an elected official who lives on this side of the city, I appreciate uh, you starting the conversation and keeping things moving. Thank you, sir. It is 724. I am going to go to um, Councilor Nicastro, and then um, on deck is Councilor Thompson with a wrap-up of the evening. I think he called it an intro uh, as opposed to an intro. I thought it was kind of funny. Anyway, uh, Councilor Knight Castro. Thank you. Very quickly. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to everyone and to listen to what everyone has to say. The planning has been very good. Thank you for your presentation, Emily um, and company. And yes, Lisa, it's a, it's a, a wicked lot of units on both sides of Massasoit Community College. It may shore up Massasoit. They have been losing students and there have been concerns there. I understand, but what will it do to our city? That's right. And even though I would prefer not to see residential there, the, 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 uh, the I don't know, d demographics and other things have changed shopping patterns and retail patterns and, and it will be very hard to get a lot of commercial business in there. Um, I know for the last couple of years that Christo's restaurant, you know, a great restaurant was a lot was was alive and kicking. They were having to shore it up financially because their business had dwindled so much. So for many reasons, um, I understand that we have to look at different things. But yes, it is a wicked lot of, of units, and we are looking at that. I believe in better, not not bigger, also. But, and, and we're watching really closely. Thatcher Street, the horse has left the barn, terribly so. Um, too many units there, but, but that is what a prior council, one that I didn't sit on approved. We go from there and we're all watching closely. Truly we are. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> and to wrap up this evening, um, but certainly not to end the conversation, uh, as we will be going on for multiple uh, sessions, uh, Councilor Thompson, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you uh, for the presentation, for Harry, and uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, Lisa, I, 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 I want to answer your question by saying this. I think our city needs to have an overall plan on what is the right size of Brockton. I think kind of all it um, uh, loose the side forest through the trees. We jump from one project to another project. We we like this one, we don't like that one. But I, I think we need a larger conversation is, um, what, what Brockton do we all want? Um, you know, we have stuff going downtown. Uh, we can agree we want our downtown to be, um, uh, you know, residents and commercial and have culture from there. But then the question becomes, well, what about side of Brooklyn? Um, I think from our discussions, uh, uh, we talked about what is the right size of Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn was, uh, to, I believe, be at least back 50, 60 years ago, a city of about 125, 130,000 people. Our uh, infrastructure was built out to, um, you know, to accommodate uh, that number of people. And so, uh, at least according to the census, uh, we're down 95,000. Now, I think anybody uh, actually needs that number. But 
but I believe that, you know, there is room for growth in Brockton. And if, if and you want the amenities uh, that the residents of Brockton are seeking, um, if we want to be able to support our fire, our police, and our school system, then we need to widen our tax base. Uh, right now, uh, due to the issues that Senator, excuse me, Councilor uh, Nextro talked about, and also the professionals that we hired, um, the, the, the uh, Hammond, uh, the, no, it's not Hammond on this art, but the uh, Donahue Institute TAP panel, uh, the, um, the, no, Bourbon Land Institute TAP panel, the University of Massachusetts Donahue Institute, they are telling us, and by friends that we see with their own eyes, uh, commercial, uh, but, but, uh, specific retail is uh, moving online. This area is too far away from 24 to be a, um, a, a place for this space. And as mentioned before, we have a lot of utilized uh, commercial space in this area to begin with. So the professionals are telling us um, what is best for this area is the type of residential development. Now we're here today to speak about type of residential development. We add an aspect commercial. What in city law uh, do you want there? But these are all conversations that we're going to continue to have. I think overall, I think we need to begin a conversation citywide about what you know is the capacity of Brock and, and how to best achieve that capacity. Because if yeah, we're growing. Uh, potentially, you know, we're done. So Since you addressed me, okay? I'm not. I'm not against growth. I'm a. I'm against more. Just throwing more housing in to get more tax base from a developer, and they're going to leave it, and we're going to be stuck with all the problems like we are on most sides of the city already. I'm. I've been in finance my whole life. I'm fully aware of what people are shopping online, and I'm fully aware of that. But the city, it, and honestly, you'd have to have your head buried in the sand to think there's only 95,000 people in the census, everybody completes it. And if it, it, no, I'm- No, I, I agree. But I, I think we need a city-wide decision. I, I, and I think we just need a city-wide decision of what the right side of Brockton and how do we achieve that size, take into account our infrastructure, our schools, our peace and fire capacity. Um, and I leave this for grow. And um, so we're going to keep on uh, discuss this. Uh, you're right. Maybe maybe density. Maybe we went out looking for 175, 200 units here. I think density is going to be a major issue here. But um, these are all issues that, that I think we're all going to discuss. Um, this is to put some ideas at the table. And uh, I'm looking forward to the comments. Anybody who wants to uh, address a question, comment me, you can reach me at jthompson at cbma.us. You can all reach me on my uh, Facebook page. Um, I, again, I thank everybody for appearing tonight, and uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Thompson. With that, it is now 7.30-ish. Um, again, it is not, it might be the end of the meeting. It is not the end of this conversation. So uh, we will be continuing uh, to take your comments throughout the rest of the month. Uh, you may have seen the plans. They are on uh, the city's website uh, under the planning department. Please share them with your friends and neighbors. And um, if you could address your comments to uh, either Councilor Thompson or uh, Myself at planning at cobma.us with the uh, subject line of Christos. Uh, I figure that'll be easier to do a search on Christos. And uh, we will create a frequently asked questions section. We will be posting this video online uh, and we will uh, be preparing a report at the end of the month where we will then go to city council and ask them what they would like to do as next steps. So uh, thank you all for participating and look forward to seeing you in the very near future. Thank you very much. Stay healthy, everyone.